Hey everyone, quick stream recap for the four hour long custom RX 6800 XT card overclocking stream. We had a few cards. There were four total choices. I don't know where I've put the other one, but there were four choices we had. Uh, the miss, where is it? <laughs> I don't remember the last few hours. I found it, it was this one. We moved it because of the liquid cooler. So we had four cards and uh, we told chat we would work on three, but that they had to fight over which one the third one was going to be for the day. So we overclocked several custom cards. The goal of this was to establish sort of a, an overclocking maximum headroom between the cards, but it's not the review. There's a lot more to video cards than overclocking. That's just a very small part of the reviews these days, but still something that we needed to find out. So we thought we'd do it live. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial Ballistics Memory, including the new kits targeted for use with AMD's new Ryzen 5000 CPUs. Crucial's new Ballistics Max Memory is some of the highest performing memory on the market and can be tuned for timings and clocks to improve performance. The company also has its other Crucial Ballistics kits for a more affordable entry to enthusiast-grade memory. Crucial is a Micron brand and has direct access to its own memory supply. Learn more at the link in the description below. So let me walk you through the final scores first, we have, I'll, I'll throw together a quick chart for the data that we can put on the screen for each one. But we start with the Sapphire Nitro, which is actually out of the system right now. That's this card. I'll kind of walk through the exterior of the cards in a bit. We'll have full reviews on at least a few of these, maybe not all of them, depending on the time. We may do a roundup or something, but we'll have full reviews to talk about the thermals, the noise normalized thermals, the pressure of the GPU against the die, the levelness or the flatness, I should say, of the cold plate, all that stuff later. But this was focused on overclocking. So that means the cards that have the highest power target are going to be advantaged and the cards that have, uh, if any of them do at this point, any sort of binning or pre-testing on the silicon would have an advantage, although that's pretty rare. So Sapphire Nitro, its base score was 9408. This was actually the lowest of them. We were running Port Royal. Score might not mean a whole lot to you, which is completely fine. Ultimately, what we're looking at is relative scaling, so percent differences between them. And uh, we were not worried about anything like comparisons to NVIDIA or we didn't do any comparisons to NVIDIA. So it's purely based on the partner models. Didn't even have the reference card in there for this one. So 9408 stock. The Rage Mode got it to 9471. So a point something percent uplift, nothing major. With some basic overclocking, we got it to 97.81, 98.24. A bit later, with MEM at 2100, we then brought it. We had a, a fail, a crash at 2600 to 2700 for the memory range. And uh, as a reminder to answer a question that was in the stream, but is worth answering again here, narrowing the range to say 2800 to 2800 megahertz doesn't work. So the AMD software forces you to have a gap between the minimum and the maximum. You can't set them both to the max value. And the max value does stop at 2800. That was not an issue for any of the cards we worked with because we were power constrained before we were constrained by the software, except for the XFX card. And I'll talk about that one in a little bit. The Sapphire card ended up at 10271. Let me do some quick math on that. So 10271 versus its baseline score, 9408, means that we had an improvement of about 9.17% on the Sapphire card from OC versus stock. Pretty damn good. But it was handily beaten by the Asus Strix Hybrid. And I'll walk through this one in a moment as well when we do the rest. I want to get through the scores first though. So this card has a massive advantage in that it's attached to a liquid cooler. And liquid cooling, because these GPUs, just like CPUs these days, boost contingent upon thermals. The lower you drive down the temperature, every couple degrees is worth a couple more megahertz. Or in the absolute worst case, it's worth stability of the frequency over time, uh, which we showed in the stream a few times, the shots of the Port Royal. Actually, we'll just go ahead and open one up right now. I did not save any of the scores, but we'll just click on one. So there's a 1004. That was an XFX card score, I think. We eventually were in the 10, 10 twos. But this, uh, frequency line down here, this pinkish line, that in the worst case with a good thermal solution is going to be roughly flat. And in the best case, it's going to be higher and flat because you'll be able to clock higher from the lower temperature of the GPU core. So anyway, that's things to think about, stuff we'll look at in the reviews. But the Strix did 10399 points. That versus the Sapphire card, 10399 versus 10271 is an improvement over Sapphire of 1.25%. So... Not a lot, especially if it's costing uh, 
well, any amount more money really. So the real benefit from something like a liquid cooler is going to be with noise normalized performance where at a given temperature, you can run it much quieter. That's the benefit. And that might not matter to a lot of people, but again, that's reviews territory. For overclocking, it's an advantage, uh, especially a competitive one, but at 1.25%, it might not be one that you can justify. I don't know the price right now though of these two cards uh, because they don't exist. I can't buy them. <laughs> so I'm not sure what they're supposed to cost, but we'll find out that for the reviews as well. The 10399 score was 2590 to 2690 for the core clock. We had a couple runs in here that you'll see in the chart I'll throw together at 2600 to 2700, which is in fact 10 megahertz higher on the core than the final run. But if you look at the scoring for it, the 26 to 2700 range was a worse performer for us than uh, 2590 to 2690. That extra 10 megahertz pushed it into territory where it could still complete the task. This is very important. I uh, hope you're taking notes if you're gonna do overclocking. It can still complete the task, but it was in the background silently unstable in a way which was hindering the performance to the tune of over 100 points. So our 2600 to 2700 run with the 2150 megahertz for the memory, which is the max AMD currently allows, that was 10215. But 10399 happened when we dropped 10 megahertz off the memory and off the core. So the clocks are lower, but in the background, there are fewer errors happening, there's less instability, and so your score boosts as a result. So just setting it to the highest number isn't the right move. Just like just setting, we talked about this on the stream too, just setting your voltage to the lowest number isn't the right move. Because as we showed with the XFX card, what was it XFX? Actually a few cards. Uh, Asus we had a best example. With Asus, we had a 9,000 something point score in the middle of a bunch of 10, 200 scores. Massive reduction in points. And the reason that happened was from reducing the voltage to 1,100 millivolts. And so if you think you have your card running stable at 1,000 millivolts, 1.0 volts or something like that, do some score checking to make sure your performance hasn't regressed. Because it's possible that you have performance regression, but it's still running. So it's not crashing from instability, it's just nuking your score or your, or your FPS in a game. Just do validation. As long as you validated the score has improved or stayed the same, then you're good to go. Anyway, for voltage on the ACES card, we got the best score with 10399 uh, points at 1100 millivolts. That's not gonna apply to every ACES Strix card, just this particular one, the GP Silicon's all the same. They're all different fitness and quality parameters. We did use fast timings in the Sapphire test, we had a like for like, with that, that was worth 62 points. And uh, it's about a 0.6% uplift. So yeah, competitive value, but maybe not elsewhere. Depends on the game probably too. So that's what we're looking at for those cards. Finally, for the XFX Merc 319, I think it's called. That one started at 9480. It was the highest of the base scores. And then it settled at 10258, which was the lowest of the overclock scores, but not by much versus the Nitro. And again, being the best or worst overclocker here doesn't necessarily mean much unless you're buying it for overclocking, but it's still an interesting thing to look at. And then the reviews will tell us more information about the quality of the cards. So that was out of 2700 to 2800 core clock. This is where XFX, it was running about 2650. This is a power color card. It was running out of about, there it is, 2650 during the actual tests. So, it wasn't like it was running 2700 to 2800, but because that was acting as an offset and we were running negative from the offset by 150 versus the max, we didn't have any room to bring it up higher because AMD's software limits you. This is something Roman talked about. It's something that was true in the last generation too. It's not new. Having with the 5700 and it's happening again now with the 6800 XT, presumably because AMD doesn't want you to be able to overclock a 6800 XT to equate a 6900 XT. That's normally why they do it. So if we could have slid that slider further, maybe XFX, would have jumped over the Sapphire Nitro. But until we can, we don't know. So that's how the cards played out. Thermally, we'll look at all that later, but let's walk through some of the designs just quickly. This is the one we didn't test today. We had chat take a vote and uh, we did a couple votes and eventually it was decided by an SSD flip. I flipped an SSD and we chose one side was XFX and the other side was power color. And the SSD landed on the side that was XFX. So, this we didn't test, the stream is four hours long, sorry, you know, gotta cut it somewhere and this was it, but we'll review it later. Um, didn't work with it, don't have a lot to say, we'll find out more in the future. For the cards we did test, let's start with the Nitro, which is the one that I started with in the stream. 
This one's got a three fan design, it's triaxial. Uh, the center fan is rotated the opposite direction and it's smaller. I think these are maybe 100 mils, we'll measure them later. In the stream I showed how the fans are connected by a single screw and then have a pin to pad so that you can pull it out and swap it, which is great. We always wanna see that. Huge design bonus, makes it easy to do warranty repair. So the center fan's a bit smaller. They're vertical fin orientation. So top to bottom airflow path on that. And then you can see the pinouts down here for the fans and their cables. On the top, there's a triple BIOS switch, sort of. The first one is actually not a physical BIOS. That'd be that position, assuming the documentation I found online is accurate, which was from Sapphire. That's a software BIOS switch. You can use their TriXX software to switch it. I have not tried that yet. The center position is, I think, the, the, the quieter of the two, and then this one was the full performance switch. So, backplate's got at least one thermal pad on there against the VRM area of the pad, we'll, of the, uh, the backplate. We'll have to look at that in the teardown. A little bit of a flow through over here. That carried over from the 5700 XT Nitro model as well, which was one of our top performers, and, uh, and that, they've carried that design over. So, you know, it's been big news because of NVIDIA, but certainly it's been done before. Okay, so that's the Nitro. Fairly large card, but not nearly as large as some of the others, like the XFX one, which has decided to stick its nose out past the usable area of the board, uh, just end of the backplate even, just to get the card to be larger than everyone else's. But you can feel some air exhaust over here, kind of an interesting design. I'm looking forward to taping it closed and testing it. There's still a plastic shroud above the fin stack. Um, they should know better. They've seen our content on it for sure but I'm assuming they think this is okay for one reason or another. We'll find out in testing if that's true or not. It's easy enough to take it out and test A, B comparisons, but perhaps because it's elevated a little bit, they're thinking that the air has a, enough of a path out. I'm not sure I agree, but that's okay. The back plate actually has a good amount of thermal pads in it. We'll talk about this later again, but uh, the fact that it's got some thermal pads in the back plate is a good sign. And the card's huge, not really much else to say. It also has a bio switch. The uh, position we tested it in it has a slightly higher power target. I think 289 watts versus 281, something like that. And then the Asus Strix was the one that kind of surprised me. This, all these other cards we've sent through testing already uh, in one form or another. So Mike's done a lot of the power testing already. We've got some bench numbers in on a few of them that are, you know, we're not finalized. They're not public yet. But they're tested. This one I had not tested at all. It arrived just the other day. Opened it right before the stream, and. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to be liquid cooled. So it is a hybrid card. It's got a VRM fan. And we took a, um, you can see here the sticker, that's not stock, that's me. So I, I put a sticker on it to take a tachometer measurement during the stream. The reason we did that was because I was trying to figure out if the fan reported speed in, in um, AMD software was this VRM fan or these fans, and it's these fans. So we validated that with physical hardware, which is not incorrect. So that's VRM cooling. I'm assuming there's a copper plate connected to the cold plate to share memory cooling. We'll find out. I don't want to take it apart until we do thermal testing on it for a lot of obvious reasons. And um, don't want to disturb the thermal paste mostly. And these do have a zero fan spin down mode, which is kind of interesting. We turned it off for the benchmarking, but it does mean they'll turn off until uh, the, presumably the GPU is at a certain temperature. I'd be more concerned about if the liquid reaches a certain temperature for the internals of the loop. Don't want to be above 60, 65 for the plastics inside of a loop, but um, we'll ask them how they did it. So that's the Asus card. Also has dual V BIOS. Uh, we put it in the performance mode BIOS, but uh, I said dual V BIOS, but yeah. Um, so not a, that's mostly going to be a fan thing, not a power thing with Asus cards right now anyway. So that'll recap the stream, the cards, and how they did. The big takeaway here is just sort of relatively flat frequency lines for all of these because they're fairly, I don't know, I, I don't know if, I can't call any of them good yet thermally because we haven't done like the component temperatures, but for this two minute test, they were fine. The question's gonna be how they do once they're in burning and we'll do that soon enough. So that's the stream recap. Hopefully that helps. Uh, just a bit, uh, a bit of fun is really what it was, but the ACES card technically was the winner even if by like one and a quarter percent. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net where until December 18th, we are working with Eden Reforestation Projects to plant 10 trees per item purchased. Or if you'd prefer, you can donate to them directly, of course. And links will be in the description below. 
or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.